Now, where would we be in surgery if we didn't talk about abdominal pain? This section is the majority of the questions for your exam, for the course, and for your life if you're a surgeon, especially a general surgeon. Now, as we know, abdominal pain and surgeons are very constricted. They like to live in quadrants. They like to pigeonhole their lives. My wife goes here or my work goes there. They pretty much did the same thing with the abdomen. Right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, epigastrum, and then what I call the big three conditions, which are generalized pain. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to take each quadrant specifically and start talking about the different conditions in them, start talking about what causes them, how do they present, how are you going to diagnose them, and then how are you going to treat them. We're going to run through each condition together, and we're going to go step by step. So get your books ready, get your notes ready, get those multiple highlighters ready, because I know some of you have like 27 of them on the table. They're color-coded, and you have a conniption when you use the wrong one. So we're going to start with an easy one. We're going to start with the left upper quadrant. Now, a lot of you are thinking, left upper quadrant, there's just a spleen. I don't know what goes on there. Well, that's pretty much it. The first condition we're going to talk about is splenic rupture. When does splenic rupture occur? There are two conditions on your exam in which splenic rupture is going to occur. The first is going to be abdominal trauma, very clearly. Classic presentations and permutations of this question have been a young child is riding their bicycle, falls down, and they hit their left upper quadrant against the curb. Or they're in a motor vehicle accident and they hit the steering column. Afterwards, they present with hypotension and tachycardia. There is the sensation of abdominal pain. There's vague upper left upper quadrant abdominal pain. And when you get labs, the hematocrit is massively decreased. The reason for that is because you're bleeding into their abdomen. Those patients get a fast assessment, and if there is a splenic injury of sorts, then they're taken and managed surgically. Another permutation of this question is splenic lacerations secondary to colonoscopy. Now, I know a lot of you are like, well, listen, Dr. Sampal, you're a gastroenterologist. Why are you bringing this up? Because it's not that common, but hey, your exam also tests you on things like good pastures and reactive arthritis, which are also not that common. And so what ends up happening is in patients, when the scope passes the splenic flexure going into the transverse colon, what happens? There is a lot of tension put on that area. Whenever you turn a corner on anything, and it's a long object, like a scope, it's going to push radial force upward onto the spleen, and patients develop splenic lacerations. Those, however, they're supported with blood products, they're supportive care. Why? Because you don't want to take out the spleen unnecessarily. In the case of somebody who has a massive splenic rupture and they're just bleeding out, you got to go in and fix that. Or you can consider them, if they're hemodynamic stable, to watch them. Splenic lacerations may have some hemodynamic compromise, they may drop their crit, but they will self-resolve over time. The reason why we don't want to take out the spleen in a lot of patients is simply because of the fact that you need your spleen. Otherwise, you become susceptible to what? Susceptible to specific organisms known as encapsulated organisms. Your pneumococcus, your meningococcus, your haemophilus B. Any patient who has a lost spleen, whether it be asplenic from having sickle cell, they had a splenic rupture that required the spleen to be taken out, or any other condition that caused them to be asplenic, they're going to need your vaccinations. The last condition in which you need to understand about the left upper quadrant, moving on, is known as irritable bowel syndrome. Now you're like, well, why is irritable bowel syndrome having to do with the splenic flexure? Irritable bowel syndrome is essentially a condition of either too much diarrhea, too much constipation, and a lot of bloating. The primary problem is that there's a lot of gas-producing bacteria in the colon. It's an issue of the flora. Irritable bowel syndrome is not a condition of being crazy and having too much anxiety and all this driving your bowels crazy. Yes, psych disorders do have a component, but the real problem is your gut flora. Now, in irritable bowel syndrome, you have a lot of methane-producing bugs that are not supposed to be there, and what they do is they produce a lot of gas. Your splenic flexure is the least tacked down area of your colon, so gas builds up there. It distends the capsule. Presentation, the patients will be tender on the left upper quadrant. They'll feel like the pain is coming out of their back. And they'll tell you that if I don't pass gas, if I don't have a bowel movement, I feel like I have a stitch in my back and I can't get it out. That is very classical for irritable bowel syndrome. Treatment consists of treating the underlying issue. 
For example, if they have irritable bowel syndrome with heavy amounts of diarrhea, you're going to go ahead and treat them, let's say, for example, for bacterial overgrowth with rifaximin. You're going to consider treating them with antispasmodics, increasing their fiber. If they have irritable bowel syndrome but they're constipation predominant, you're going to try using a FODMAP diet, which means reducing the foods that are gas producing, giving them medications that are going to increase their bowel transit time and take care of their constipation, whether it be something mild like a gentle laxative or something heavy duty like a medication that would cause like a prostaglandin analog or something like linaclotide, which will then cause them to have an influx of fluid into the colon. Any of these treatments that you'll have discussed in the GI section are going to help with the splenic flexure syndrome. But you need to know it for your exam because Patients are going to present with this and doctors constantly misrepresent them and think that they're having something very acute go on. Now, can a gastric ulcer feel like left upper quadrant pain? Yes, that's why history is so important. Why? Because if they say to you, it feels better when I actually have a bowel movement, that's not a gastric ulcer. Now, that takes care of our left upper quadrant. That takes care of our left upper quadrant. There's not much else up there to discuss. Let's move now into our left lower quadrant. Left lower quadrant is the area that all of our elderly patients deal with. So classically, your left lower quadrant patient is going to be elderly. They're going to be elderly. They're going to be elderly. So connect that to your left lower quadrant. The first condition is volvulus. The first condition is volvulus. Now, volvulus is essentially a malrotation of your large bowel causing an obstruction. This is a surgical emergency. These patients are going to present with obstipation, constipation, left lower quadrant pain. Obstipation, constipation, left lower quadrant pain. Best initial test is going to be an x-ray. The x-ray is going to actually show dilated colon proximal to the volvulus and possible dilated even small bowel loops. Why? Because gas is building up and it's moving its way towards the back. This condition must be treated immediately. Now, how do you treat volvulus? Well, the best initial therapy is actually a colonoscopy. That's right. By using a colonoscopy, you can actually reduce the volvulus. However, if the patients present with hemodynamic instability and elevated lactates, and they're presenting with signs and symptoms of either sepsis or even perforation, then they're going to have to go straight to surgery. They've missed that window to be reduced by a gastroenterologist. Surgery is the only therapy at that point. The next condition in the left lower quadrant is diverticulitis, which you've also gone over, but this is a surgical case. Now, diverticulitis is also going to be an elderly patient. They're going to say the patient's chronically constipated. Remember, patients who are chronically constipated have increased intraluminal pressures. Those increased intraluminal pressures allow for little pockets to develop in the colon known as diverticula. Those diverticula can sometimes become occluded, and an extra space that's occluded and closed off for any of the bacteria like E. coli that live in your gut essentially turns into a pocket of pus. And so that's what diverticulitis is. They're going to present with fever, an elevated white count, and left lower quadrant pain. They will not have bloody diarrhea. Remember, diverticulosis is a cause of painless bleeding per rectum. Diverticulitis is an infectious inflammatory condition from diverticulosis or diverticula becoming occluded. The test of choice for left lower quadrant pain and diverticulitis is a CAT scan. What you're going to see is pericolonic inflammation and fat stranding. These patients are treated with antibiotics and if they have recurrent symptoms and they have recurrent bouts of diverticulitis, there's no magic number, but recurrent bouts of diverticulitis, they will never tell you 3, 7, 12 number of times they've had it, but they'll say the patients had recurrent episodes of diverticulitis and the episodes are occurring with less and less time in between. The frequency is increasing and the amount of time for them to occur is getting shorter and shorter. They then require surgical resection. Otherwise, simple management with antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin and metronidazole are okay. Now you got to hang out with my girl Liz, that's right, ovarian torsion and ectopic pregnancy can also present in the left lower quadrant, but I do not want you guys picking this answer if the patient is male. That's right, I cannot tell you the number of times I get a phone call, ring ring, hello, yes, oh yes, this is Dr. Sampo, oh well hello student, well, how was the exam? Oh, I see, you had a patient who you thought had ectopic pregnancy, it was a 25 year old male, I think you got it wrong.
So remember, ovarian torsion is going to be the sudden onset of left lower or right lower quadrant pain. Ectopic pregnancies, they're going to tell you about a patient who's been having unprotected sex, pregnancy test is positive, pain is there. But they're going to try to steer it towards that area. The abdomen is just really, really acute. And so that's how they're going to steer it in those directions. But again, you've gone over these sections before in your GYN section. If you haven't, you can pause it, go hang out with Liz, come back with me in a moment. That's what's the beauty of MedQuest. Now, moving away from the left lower quadrant, moving away from the left lower quadrant, the other thing that they're going to ask you here is diverticulitis. A patient has diverticulitis and then presents after treatment two weeks later with just fevers, no pain. Just fevers, no pain. Just fevers, no pain. Diverticulitis, two weeks later, just fevers, no pain. You have to start thinking diverticular abscess. That's right. Remember, patients who come in and they actually have, let's say, for example, UTI that progressed and now they have what? That's right. They have an actual infection of their kidney. They can also develop perinephric abscesses as well. Same exact idea here. You can have diverticulitis. The antibiotics help, but there was already a development of an abscess. If a patient comes back after an episode of diverticulitis and they're noted to have fevers, you have to get another CAT scan. It will show a fluid collection. That fluid collection has to be drained. It can be drained either surgically, but we prefer percutaneous drainage by interventional radiology. They also still require further antibiotics. Now we're going to move into our right lower quadrant. Ladies and gentlemen, we are moving through the entire abdomen because these are the questions you're going to get on your exam. On your exam. Right lower quadrant. The first thing that you all will get questions on is appendicitis. Appendicitis. Appendicitis is going to be focal right lower quadrant pain over McBurney's point. These patients are going to have a fever and white count. It's going to be very, very severe. They can have Rovsing sign. They can also start out with pain over the umbilicus and then progress over to the right side. These are all classical findings of a patient with appendicitis. Best initial test? Well, it turns out that if a patient comes in with right lower quadrant pain, fevers, and an elevated white count, surgeons can actually go ahead and say, you know what, clinically this sounds like it's an appendicitis episode. Let's take the patient to surgery. The most accurate test, however, is going to be a CAT scan, known as an appendiceal protocol. That's right. They do a quick run of contrast. They go ahead, and if they see the following three findings that you need to know for your exam, a dilated appendix, thickened appendiceal wall, and fluid around the area, that right there is findings consistent with appendicitis. The treatment, well, the best initial therapy is going to be antibiotics, and surgical removal of the appendix is indicated. That is how we take care of appendicitis. Right lower quadrant pain, fever and a white count. CAT scan is the most accurate test. Shows inflammation in the thickened appendiceal wall and fluid around the area. Start them on antibiotics, fluids, NPO, NG tube if they need it, because if they're vomiting, take them to the OR, take it out, boom, they're feeling better, everyone's happy. Can't go wrong. Ovarian torsion, don't forget you have two sides of the ovaries, so you can have ovarian torsion and ectopic pregnancies on the right as well. You can also have diverticulitis on the right. Now remember, you can have cecal diverticulitis. You can have diverticula anywhere in your colon. You can also have diverticula in your small intestine. Point of note, if a patient comes in with diarrhea and they have, let's say, small bowel diverticula, the most common reason for the diarrhea is actually bacterial overgrowth. That extra surface area is just a place for the bacteria to get busy and they end up causing bacterial overgrowth and diarrhea. But there's another condition in the right lower quadrant that you need to know as students for this exam, right here. It's called Yersinia pestis. Oh, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Not Yersinia pestis, because what's Yersinia pestis? The plague, I got you, ha ha. It's not Yersinia pestis, it's Yersinia entercalitica. Don't get fooled, because Yersinia is a cause of what's known as pseudo-appendicitis. Now what is pseudo-appendicitis? Well, let's say for example a guy named Nick is saying, well listen, I want to go to a barbecue and he has a pastry. What he doesn't know is the person who made these pastries left them out for a long period of time and they're cream pastries because you know what? Nick likes cheese danish. And he ends up eating this cheese danish but it's been sitting out in the sun. It's a barbecue. Who brings cheese danish to a barbecue? That person should really be considered to be odd in the first place. So let's say, for example, his best friend Charles brought a cheese danish to eat at a barbecue instead of bringing like a beer or let's say a hot dog or whatever it might be. And Nick eats this cheese danish. Now Nick is eating this cheese danish and what he doesn't know is that Yersinia enterocolitica likes cream-based foods that sit out in the sun. He ingests this and what they 
cause, it moves into your right lower quadrant and causes you to have severe pain and diarrhea and you think that the patient has appendicitis. But all of the other findings, the Rove Singh sign, the actual SOA sign, none of them are positive. So the physical findings are a little off. And so if you have a patient who has a negative CAT scan for appendicitis, but right lower quadrant pain, the answer is pseudo-appendicitis from Yersinia entercolitica. Entercolitica. They're going to have diarrhea. Remember, patients who have actual, actual appendicitis, they don't have diarrhea. That's how you can actually tell the two apart on the exam. Clinically, it's a little harder to do so. The other thing you have to consider for your right lower quadrant, which is also rare, is something known as tiflitis. Tiflitis presents with right lower quadrant pain. But when you get a CAT scan, you notice that the appendix isn't actually inflamed. It's the cecum. It's like a cicitis. And this is usually from a viral infection. It's self-resolving. You just give them fluids and you watch them with serial abdominal exams because the cecum is the thinnest part of your colon. If it gets too inflamed, you have to worry about an actual perforation. Now we're going to move on now to our epigastrum as well as our right upper quadrant. So stay tuned for the next slide.